Okay, go for it. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone. Uh, and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. So this is the third lecture in the Vanguard Ishray series. And my name is Broto, and I'm going to talk about uh, active matter and its hydrodynamics. So a little bit about me. Uh, I, oh no, slide just made. okay. So I uh, graduated from the mechanical engineering department of Jadavpur University in 2013, where I was primarily working with Himadri sir, Professor Himadri Chattopadhyay. Then I did my master's at Virginia Tech, where I worked with James Hanna on problems related to dynamical systems and elasticity. I did my PhD at UCSD working with David Santia uh, on fluid structure interaction problems. And now I am a postdoc at the Simons Foundation with Mike Shelley, where I'm uh, looking at problems in biophysics. So that's about me. Okay, so before I begin, I uh, this is a Zoom talk. and I have not given many Zoom talks. I just want to put some logistics disclaimers out there. So first thing is uh, I don't actively work on active matter. I hope you get the pun there. <laughs> so uh, this is something I am interested in. I'm not really worked on it uh, directly, but so I may not have answers to all the questions that you have, but I will, I'm assuring you that if I can't answer something, I will get back to you later on. The aim of this lecture is to introduce active matter for undergrads in engineering with some interest uh, or inclination in fluids. So that's, that's my target today. Uh, when I was in undergrad, like always 10 years back, I guess, uh, we didn't know much about active matter. It was still a topic that was still emerging. Uh, and I, I probably didn't hear about active matter in my undergrad. So things have changed now. Maybe some of you already know about these things. So it can turn out to be a very basic talk for some of you, but uh, bear with me. I'm sure there will be something new for everyone. And I've tried to keep the talk as non-rigorous as possible. Uh, but I mean, I understand there are students from all years, first year, fourth year, and there are some students doing MTech. Uh, so, I mean, if you are if you are not following somewhere, please interrupt me and just unmute yourselves. Okay, you don't need to type questions in chat box. Just just unmute and ask a question if you have one. If you, if it's a philosophical question, that can probably wait till the end. But any clarification, please please don't hesitate. Uh, there are kind of two parts of the talk. The part one is a general overview of what active matter is, some examples. And in part two, I actually want to work out uh, a problem which requires a bit of fluids and PDs. We'll see what how, how that goes. Okay. And the last one is a request. So if if the lecture is okay, and if if you can, please stay back. We want to have some suggestions from you guys uh, about what you want to hear in future and things like that. Okay. So let's get started with the topic. So uh, the word active matter essentially has two words. Uh, active and matter. And matter for me is just essentially collection of particles. Okay. So active matter is collection of active particles. But then there is a circularity in this definition. I have to define what an active particle is. So let's start with that. What, what I mean by an active particle. And I will do this with an example. So on the left hand side, I have a, I have a model of matchstick, Deshlai Kati. So this matchstick, if you put in water, it floats in water and there is surface tension forces acting on it. Now, what you do is that you coat one end of the matchstick with a little bit of soap. That's this blue colored patch that I've drawn, drawn over here. And then you put it on the water. And what happens is surfactant soap uh, creates a surface tension gradient. So the, it lowers the surface tension locally in the water. And this creates a gradient difference in surface tension. And as a result, there is an unbalanced force and this particle moves, okay? It moves with some velocity. And this is what I would call a self-propelled particle or a SPP. So this is my example of active particle. And let me now think of a definition. So these particles are agents or anything that's driven by some continuous supply of energy. And they use that energy to move. So essentially, they use it for generating mechanical motions. That's, that's all they're doing. And since they're continuously driven, they're inherently out of equilibrium. So let me give you a more concrete example. So this is something that people don't use in experiments. But on the right hand side, I have something that people do. So this is a sphere, actually, this is a gold particle, which is a very tiny gold particle, it's the size of one micrometer. And what you do is that you coat one half of this particle by platinum, and you put it in a hydrogen peroxide solution. So then what happens is this platinum reacts with hydrogen peroxide, and it creates a surface stresses at the end of this particle in this blue region, which surface stress, stress pushes this particle in the opposite, di opposite direction. It moves quite fast, 15 to 30 micrometers per second. And this is fast because 
this is just one micrometer it's really moving many body lengths per second so this is again an example of active particle as long as you can have this reaction between platinum and hydrogen peroxide going it will keep on moving so this is it's fuel or continuous supply of energy and it's driven so these are synthetic examples but let's look at some biological ones so uh I, I, I let me introduce the Reynolds number first. So this is the most important dimensionless number in fluid mechanics. And it's a ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. So if Reynolds number is large, that's the regime that we probably live in. Uh, it's essentially things are turbulent, things are chaotic. That's large Reynolds number. Uh, low Reynolds number means things are laminar. It's very viscous, smooth, nice flows. So that's, that's a way to think about it. So let's look at some examples. So first I have two examples of birds and fish. These are again active particles because birds or fish, they're all consuming chemical energy. That's they are eating some food, nutrients, and they're using that chemical energy to fly and swim, right? So these are again active particles. And they are they fly or they do behave at high Reynolds number. That's Reynolds number is order 10,000. And on the right, I have examples from extremely low Reynolds number. So this is a sperm cell and this is a bacteria that's called E. coli. These are again in very viscous fluids, very tiny objects. So their size is typically. Uh, five to ten micrometers, and these objects again, uh, they are uh, they are they are active particles because they're consuming chemical energy or ATP to move. In the middle, I have one example. It's it's a picture from a hook color of actually. So these, these are again, we are all active agents because uh, we are human beings. We are consuming energy. We are moving, and we have a bunch of active agents. And this is the main point. Uh, that's when you have a bunch of active agents or active particles, it defines an active matter. So what I will do is that in the next few slides, I will tell you uh, some generic features of active matter and show you some examples of what, what happens when you have many active particles together. Okay, this is a really classic example that, uh, that you go to any active matter talk, someone will have this. So this is uh, an example of flocking. So these are birds, these are called starling. I hope the movie is playing. Uh, these are starling, starlings are like sparrows. And they form these beautiful flocks as they move in thousands, right? There are thousands of birds over here. And if you look at this whole flock, then this fall flock as a whole behaves like a fluid or a soft solid that can deform and twist and can move together, okay? And you would see these beautiful density waves, these black patches that appear during this flocking motion. And again, this is at high Reynolds number, it's 10,000 Reynolds number maybe. So if you, you, you will soon see the birds closely, this, this, there will be a zoom, zoomed in view, it's right now. And if you look closely, then you may not find any pattern. You may look like that they're moving randomly, but once you look back at a larger length scale, things move collectively and coherently. And they generate this emergent behavior or collective behavior together. So this is the main feature that I want to focus on, that when you have many active particles moving together, they exhibit collective or emergent behavior. Okay. Another example, this is much less common. So, yeah. So brother, uh in the, so when you said the Reynolds number is uh, the pretty high, uh, what is the length, what what is your length scale here? Is it the, the length uh, scale? The length scale is is the length scale. I think uh, is the length scale of the bird. The length scale of the bird is the okay. Uh, and uh, your definition of active particle seems uh, to be quite genre, where it seems like anything which has an, any injection of energy and can self propel is uh, is an, an active particle. particle. Yes, yes, that's that's very very generic. Yeah. It's, okay. it's a very broad definition, yeah. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is a much less common uh, example. This is uh, called huddling of penguins. So these are actually emperor penguins in Antarctica. And it's very cold, right? It's minus 50 degrees Celsius. And these birds uh, move together in these clusters. And they, I mean, they move and form these clusters essentially. And they of course do this to pack as tightly as possible to mitigate this strong winds and cold, okay? But what's nice is that once they form these clusters, you'll see in this video down below, there is this beautiful density waves that propagate in these clusters. And these density waves have some similarities with the flocking behavior that I showed you. Let me play that again, these density waves. So together, this form this crystal-like structure and this collective behavior, the emergent, emergent structure is not a fluid. This is more like a solid or a, a packed bed of sands maybe. So they're just forming these crystals and again on these crystals there's this wave propagation. And they do that to kind of move collectively together and also to make sure that people who are, I mean by people I mean the penguins which, which are in, in the periphery can move inside to mitigate cold. So this is, this is what they're forming and this is called huddling. Again, the main point is that they're 
exhibiting this collective behavior uh, by individual motions of these active particles or active agents. In this case, it's birds. Now let's go back uh, to fluid mechanics and let's look at an example from low Reynolds number. So now I have thinking of a bacteria. It's, this bacteria is called Bacillus subtilis. So this, this is a rod shaped object, as you can see in this picture, this tiny, this is five to 10 micrometers long. And they kind of move around in fluid, in viscous flows. And when there are many of such particles, this is in large density, if you can see in this movie, they form these beautiful vertical structures. Okay, so this is again an example of emergent or collective behavior. And this vertical structure can mix the fluid very well. Just to point out, this is uh, extremely low Reynolds number flow, very viscous. So it's still not nothing like turbulence, but they have features which resembles turbulence. So this is very unique to active systems that have this continuous supply or continuous injections of energy. And that's why they form this collective behavior. So this is another example. So I've given three examples from living world. Let's look at a synthetic example. So this is a, a colloidal particle and it has a, a iron, iron thing. This is again, one micrometer long and this is a hematite. So this is a ferromagnetic particle that's kind of glued to this object and it's a hydrogen peroxide solution. So what happens since they are very tiny, they kind of fluctuate. That's Brownian fluctuation on noise. I will talk about Brownian motion later on, but you can just imagine if you're it's very small, you get getting bombarded by molecules and you're fluctuating, but then you turn on the light and this light causes a reaction between hydrogen peroxide and this hematite particle and they start moving. That's this picture on the left hand side. Okay. What was really nice, if they are really in few, you don't see anything, but once you have many of them, that's the right hand side, you turn on the light and they start forming these clusters. Okay. And this is purely mediated by interactions that happen through fluids. So this is purely fluid mechanics. And these clusters form, these clusters again look like crystals and sometimes they're called living crystals. Okay. But again, the main point that I want to drive in is that you have active agents in many number, in large numbers, and together they exhibit this fascinating collective behaviors. And moment you turn off the light, moment they're not active anymore, they disintegrate. So everything is really driven by activity over here. Okay, some more examples. I, I mean, this, this list can go on really. Uh, uh, some more examples. Uh, this is first, let's look at two examples from living active matter. So this is a very classic problem. This is an example of schooling of fish. We have this fish, this is sardines that are swimming in ocean and they form again this flock that can move and twist. It's very much like the swarming of birds that I showed you before. This is an example from development of an embryo. So this is a 2D surface. It's like an ellipse, ellipsoid. And these tiny objects are cells. These cells flow during the development of this embryo. Cells are active agents as well. They're consuming energy and they flow like a fluid, but then they behave like a solid to give some integrity. Okay, that's again collective behavior. Down below I have some synthetic examples. This is the first example is called quinky rollers. They're again tiny micro particles that are driven by electric fields and they roll on surfaces. And when there are many large number of these particles, they, they form this beautiful, beautiful vertical structure as you can see over here. And uh, in a, in a other geometry, they can form this density waves. So this is like a snake that's running and you can clearly see that there is a front or dense, dense front. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you can see this white color dense front. Okay. okay. And over here, I have an example of microtubules. So I don't expect you to know what microtubule is, uh, but it is essentially a string. Okay. Just think about it as a filament or a floppy object string. And there is a lot of this micros, the microscopic size object, many of them. And there are some molecular machines that pull on these objects. And as a result, they again form these beautiful structures. Uh, these, are, these are called pneumatics. Uh, this, is, this looks like turbulence, but it's again not turbulence. It's again extremely low Reynolds number. Okay, so I will skip the last example. Okay, so where do we stand? They, First thing is that we have defined what I know, mean by an active particle, things that consume energy and move. That's all, I, all that I mean. An active system is essentially a collection of these active particles that can exhibit this nice collective behavior. So all the examples I, I showed you, they, they show this spontaneously nice behaviors or collective or emergent behaviors. So from a physics perspective, what do we want to understand of, of this system? Okay. So, the thing is that since you have continuous supply of energy, since you're always injecting energy at the microscopic length scale for each individual particles, 
these systems are inherently out of equilibrium. Okay, so if you think of your equilibrium thermodynamics or principles, you cannot really write down something like a free energy and minimize it to find states. So in the, this context, let me let me kind of bring an example which which will help us motivate the or frame the question that I want to ask. I think in class 11 and 12, we studied this, but we then forget about this, is that there is a transition from ferromagnet to paramagnet. So ferromagnets are these materials where uh, they have these magnetic dipoles or spins that are aligned in one direction. But as you increase temperature, there is a critical temperature after which these dipoles kind of get disordered. They behave like a paramagnet. So this is an example of what is called a phase transition because you transition from one phase to the other by controlling some parameter in the problem. So now if I'm thinking of matter, when you think of matter, you can define things like whether it's a gaseous or whether it's solid or fluid, but these are again phases. And my questions that I want to ask, is there some parameters in this problem that I can control or tune which drives transitions from different phases? Okay, I mean, but it can become solid, it can become gas, it can behave like a jammed object. So what is, what is this parameter that's driving this kind of phases? And what kind of, what dictates the control or emerging states? Is it density or how they interact with the geometry? So we want to understand these features or how collective behavior, behavior emerges. That's the first question that we understand, want to understand. And if we do understand that, whether we can use that in some, some way to design new materials or understand biology and things like that. So that, that's more broad questions. So what I will do is in this talk, I, I will not go into these philosophical discussions of how to use them, but I will tell you about a very simple model to start with that can capture this behavior, okay? Okay, so here is this model. This is known as Vishik model. It uh, was proposed in 1995. So what I will do is that I will think of all the active particles. Think about the birds. That's easiest to think about. I will think of my birds as arrows. So these are the arrows and these are my birds, okay? And these arrows essentially represent a velocity vector. So each birds are flying, they are moving in one direction, and they have this, this direction of motion is given by this velocity vector. And I mean, thinking in 2D, so this velocity vector can be written as some cosine theta and sine theta. So there is an angle, and then there is a velocity, and they're moving with a constant velocity that's V naught. Okay. That's my model of active agents or active particles. But now I have to write how they evolve. Well, the position changes very simply by this relation. So this is just saying that dr dt is r is the position, dr dt is uh, my velocity. So position at new time is position at old time plus the velocity vector times delta t. This is very simple. But what I do for the angle is I define some sort of interaction. Let me, let me again explain this. So think about this red arrow. Let's call this particle i. What I do is that I go ahead and draw some circle, green circle of radius r. And if there are some neighbors inside this circle, all I do is that I average my angle uh, for the next time. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, so I thought I, I broke for, for yeah, a moment. Okay. okay, sorry, let, let me continue. Okay, so that, that's what I'm doing. I, I, I draw a circle and I'm just averaging. So this is just averaging particles or neighbors and trying to find a mean direction. Okay, I will, I, will, I will see in a movie and it will be clear. So what there is, there is another term that's called noise. So what noise does is that it's like a drunk man. Okay, so if you think if someone is drunk and he starts walking, uh, then what happens is changes direction randomly. Right? He walks in straight direction, then moves in other direction, keeps doing that. So that's what this noise is doing. So it's trying to destabilize this mean orientation and just want to put particles in random direction. So what this model predicts is that if you reduce noise in the system, then there is a phase transition from a disordered state to a state that's flocking. This may sound very technical, but I will play a movie and it will be very clear, okay? So let's do that actually. Instead uh, of, uh, may I ask a question before you move to the next slide? Yes. When you when you said that you were averaging uh, uh, the angle, so, so first of all, uh, is this a relative angle between uh, uh, any two velocity vectors? Like I want to know what to, No, it's not the relative angle. It's not the relative angle. So if if theta is the angle, right? So suppose my neighbors are in two different angles, and next okay. instant I just do my new angle will be the mean of all the angles inside this disk. So you're averaging over time or a space. It's a, it's a, in certain ways averaging of a space. It's inside. It's an average inside this disk. Okay, so it's like okay. Think about it that you are in, in a room and there are many people, 
and you you can't move randomly so you what you do is that you essentially align yourselves with your neighbors right so you specially try to align with the neighbor so you don't collide with people so that's what this is doing this averaging is doing broto i have a question yeah so when you define this circular disk uh, a few minutes back when uh, kora was asking you the question on reynolds number you said that it's the size of the bird but so, when you so, this yeah. problem uh, so, yeah go ahead go ahead shouldn't uh, the size of the circle that you decide to track uh be the determinant for the Reynolds number should it be the size of the particle so okay so so a couple of things i probably didn't explain this very well so there is no fluid in this problem so i'm just thinking of these as some arrows okay there is no fluid mechanics right now there is no Reynolds number in this problem at all and i'm thinking of my birds as point particles but just with an arrow okay so there is no Reynolds number right now no i think my question still stands so it's it, eventually we are trying to track something in a continuum right so when you are trying to track the uh, the crowd behavior in the birds yeah what is your characteristic length scale is it the length scale of the bird okay. or is it okay the... okay okay so so okay if you want to understand continuum behavior of the whole system then the characteristic size will be the system size okay but what I, the reynolds number that i wrote is a reynolds number for an individual bird i didn't write the reynolds number for the whole flock okay okay yeah and if that is so so if you think about uh, the crowd behavior so uh, i think the main component in there are this kind of circular uh, chunks right right these chunks are varying with respect to each other absolutely absolutely okay yeah this go ahead okay so let me let me play a movie i think that that will be more clear so uh, let me set this and this is what's happening actually okay can you see my screen by the way yes yes this is oh you can see matlab right yep okay great so this is this is my picture of active particles okay so these are these are this these particles you can see the arrows hopefully they are moving randomly you, you don't see anything in this case okay they are just moving in random directions with these velocity vectors and this looks like i would call this a gas so this looks like a gas okay uh, or this is a disordered state what i will do is that i have this parameter r that i drew in this picture right in this circular disk i will change the radius r and we'll see what happens okay i will i first initially was r was zero so they were not interacting i change the radius r and you see what happens is that now when these neighbors kind of collide they try to form some sort of alignment it's probably not still clear because it's r is too small uh, let me increase r actually <laughs> so let me make r 0 0.4 okay you see now they have started forming these small clusters, right? So as they go together, they try to align with the neighbors. You can see them aligning as they kind of merge or collide. And this alignment creates these small clusters, okay? Now what happens if you just increase R even farther, this cluster size increases. So that's, that's this behavior. You have these large clusters forming now. Uh, and then let me increase R even farther. So let me make this 0.5 or something. Hopefully something interesting happens. You clearly see now these vertical structures that are appearing initially. There is nice strong alignment. This looks like magnetic field lines. And then this whole thing forms a big cluster and moves together. And this is what I call flocking, right? So this initially they were moving randomly or in a disordered way. Now everyone wants to align with their neighbors. As a result, this whole thing moves as a flock. And this is a very simple example of what I would call emergent behavior because you start from something that's very simple, microscopic, but then you end up in this state of flocking. Okay, so let me let me kind of recap again this point. Uh, you just start with some interaction with neighbors, which just tells you that you want to align with your neighbors, and this simple interaction gives rise to this emergent behavior and causes a transition from a disordered state, which looked like a gas, to an emergent collective behavior. Okay, so just to Put this in context i showed you a movie of bacteria uh, much before so there is some kind of transition that happens in there okay i should make it full screen so this is uh, this is a disordered state where they're moving randomly but now this is a swarming phase when there are many particles they kind of want to get aligned and they're looking at they look like this flux i'm not saying this is exactly the same model this has a very different model but qualitatively they look similar now what's really nice about this model what i like is that it's very simple right it's it's uh, this matlab code that i wrote it's it's 50 or 60 lines anyone can write it it's very simple to start with it gives you an insight to what's going on but what's kind of is the shortcoming is that there is no physics like the questions i think choikada was asking is 
things like there, there is fluid mechanics. These are balls that are flying. So there is interesting things that's going on there, but this model kind of completely ignores it. Uh, so what I want to do is that in the next, next half of the talk, so this, is, this ends my first part. In the next half of the talk, I want to talk about one particular system and try to write down equations or derive equations from physics, uh, from microscopic physics that can give rise to our emergent behaviors, okay? Is this, is this okay so far? Or, uh, I mean, this is new part, okay? Uh, any questions or any, any comments, anything, it's, it's fine. You can ask me the now. Previous previous video, is the domain bounded or that kind of thing? Oh, that's, that's a good point. I didn't mention that. The domain that I did in my simulation is periodic. It's not bounded. Sorry, someone is asking a question, but I can't hear you. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Okay. The second part of the talk is about uh, bacterial suspension. That so, uh, yeah. if anyone has any questions, uh, you can also leave it them in the chat window. If you don't, chat, want whatever you, whatever yeah. works best for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Broto uh, Chandan here. I yeah, yeah. was just uh, curious that in this kind of lower order model, you yeah. like just for demonstration, yeah. have uh, people try to include like other than this average of the relative position of this circular domain. Any other kind of interaction model that has been worked yes. on? Yes. So, so there is a very rich literature on Vishak model, and a lot of models have been worked out. In fact, I'm doing this averaging because this is the original 1995 paper, but there are uh, essentially you can write averaging kernels, which looks like sine theta j minus theta i. And uh, those models give rise to collective behavior as well. And depending on what kind of interactions you choose, you can get different kinds of collective behaviors. People have worked out examples inside boundaries as well. So I was looking in this periodic domains, but you can confine it. And then you have interactions with the boundaries that gives rise to certain behavior as well. So yes, there are, there are other, I mean, if you're interested, I can point you to some. some okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, if I understand correctly, physically, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, physically, this means that if you have low noise, that as you're decreasing the noise, essentially you're seeing uh, more and more uh, alignment. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying. Roto, I, okay. I have a question. So yeah. this is Tomal. Yeah, Tomal. So uh, you show a dynamic behavior, like you had this uh, scattered thing, and then when you run this over time, so yeah. you get this alignment. Yeah. So what dy dynamical equation you solve? Because I see. Oh, I'm solving these equations. So I'm just solving this. So just, you don't uh, optimize anything for. No, uh, getting no, no, no optimization. So this is, I'm just using. Uh, the worst thing that you can do in numerics, it's just an Euler time step. So d mm -hmm. dx dt is v. So x at time t plus delta t is x at time t plus delta t times v. I'm just integrating these two equations. Nothing nothing else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Thanks. Okay. So the second part is about uh, bacterial suspensions. And there are two things that I want to cover before I talk about bacterial suspension. Uh, I, I guess that there are students from different years. So I will little talk about a little bit about Brownian motion and diffusion, and then talk a little bit about fluid mechanics before I go into the actual problem. So the couple of slides is not about active matter first, it's about general things, okay? Okay, so uh, Robert Brown uh, was a Scottish botanist who was studying pollen grains of uh, flowers. And these are very tiny particles. And under the microscope, he observed this jittery motion of these particles. And this is known as Brownian motion, okay? So over here, I have a, a picture from Wikipedia, actually. So this yellow dot R particle is, is, is some microscopic particle. It has size, say, 5 to 10 micrometers. And it is in, in water, say. Okay, it's in a solvent. And these tiny black dots are molecules of that solvent or water. So what's happening is this all molecules are continuously colliding with this particle, right? And as they collide, they exchange momentum. And then this is, of course, not balanced completely. As a result, the particle moves on. Okay, so this is Brownian motion. Okay, and what I want to do is that if I want to understand this motion, I go back to my old friend, that's Newton's laws of motion, and write down mass times acceleration, this m times a, is the forces on the right-hand side. Okay, and what are the forces? The first force is a Brownian force, FBR, and I'm not going to define how you compute these forces, but this force is arising from the collision of molecules. That's, that's the source of this force. And then there is this term that's uh, minus zeta v. So what is that? Because, because this particle is in a solvent or in a fluid, 
as it moves, it experiences drag, right? So this is the drag force, which is linear in velocity. And this is a drag coefficient that's for a sphere is six pi mu a. And this should remind you that in class 11 and 12, we study Stokes drag of particles, which we just say that is six pi mu a. And I think in, in mechanical undergrad, actually in second year or third year, I don't remember, we do an experiment where we measure this yes. Stokes drag, right? So this is, this is just a drag, okay. And what it turns out is that uh, in these kind of configurations, when these particles are really tiny, where Brownian motions matter, this term mass times acceleration is really small. So you can drop this term and you again end up with a simple equation that just tells you that drag forces are balanced by these Brownian forces. And I'm again doing an Euler time step and saying that my position at n plus one is position at n plus delta t times this Brownian force. Okay, so that's that's my crash introduction on Brownian motion. But even we, if we don't study Brownian motion, there is something that we study quite a bit in undergrad, or, or at least we have very good intuition about, is that's diffusion, okay? So that's, that's this example down below. So you have a dye, this blue color dye. There are three glasses of water, warm, hot, and cold at different temperatures. You put this dye and you just wait, you're not stirring it. It gets mixed and this mixing is purely due to diffusion. Okay, this dye diffuses in water and this whole liquid becomes blue. And you can see that diffusion is higher in faster, not higher, it's faster in, in the hot fluid and the cold fluid is slower, right? So what's, what's the microscopic viewpoint of this whole process? This is, of course, we understand diffusion, we are, we have an intuition about diffusion. The microscopic is Brownian motion, right? You can think of this tiny, uh, you can think of this dye as collection of thousands of these tiny particles. And these particles are exchanging momentum with the fluid. And as a result, they get mixed or they get transported. So that's what is happening. But remember, when you think of diffusion, you don't need to think of Brownian motion, right? You, we, we know about diffusion independent of Brownian motion. And that's kind of the beauty of physics, I guess, is that there is this principle of pore straining that when you describe something in large scale in continuum, you don't need to know about the microscopic physics. So this is this, this, is this diffusion law, this is diffusion equation. And what it tells you, this, this is fixed law that tells you that there is a flux or current from high concentration gradient to lower concentration gradient with D is the diffusivity. So that's this fixed law and that's something that's very intuitive, I think, that if you have die concentrated at one point, drive it, try to spread out. That's what this is telling you. And this is diffusion equation in 1D, and then this is diffusion equation 2D. So it's, it's, a, it's the same, uh, same thing that we have just generalized now with uh, uh, two terms. Okay, So that's the evolution of the field of concentration. But you should remember the microscopic physics is Brownian motion, the macroscopic description of the emerging description is diffusion equation that we study in first year and second year. And we study it in, in great detail, essentially. So uh, what I can do now is that uh, I can show you some simulations actually again. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a periodic box again. And this blue thing that you see inside is the dye that I introduce, okay? So these are, this is essentially discrete simulation. You will see this is Brownian simulations. There are many particles and you let it play. You immediately see that these particles are jittering, uh, but they spread out radially. And if you just wait long enough, they will fill up the whole box. So essentially you start with a high probability of finding all the particles at the center, but you wait long enough, there is a uniform probability of finding everything everywhere, right? So that, that, that's, that's, what's, that's what diffusion. But what you can do is nice is that mm -hmm. while you can do this discrete problem, if you want, you can also solve the diffusion equation. So that's what I'm doing over here. And this is, I'm solving the diffusion equation 2D, okay? And what you see, let me try to pull it over here. What you see is at the center, there is this concentration of dye or particles that you had before. And this is just a profile in the 3D. I just let it play and you will see that things spreading radially outwards. And then again, you're having a homogeneous, nice distribution. So this is, this is diffusion, it smooths things out. It disperses things, right? So all I want you to remember from this part, at least, is whenever you have some sort of Brownian motion or noise at the microscopic length scale, you should remind yourself that there is diffusion at the macroscopic length scale over here. Okay. So that that's that's one thing I want to want to remember. Uh, I can't see my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So uh, let's talk a little bit about fluid mechanics now. So I want to talk about Stokes flow. So the, again, the, the D-dimensionless number of fluid mechanics is the Reynolds number. It's a ratio of inertial forces or viscous forces, and it's defined as rho 
times some velocity scale, times some length scale over the viscosity of the fluid. So rho is the density, mu is the viscosity. And I am interested in a regime where Reynolds number is really small. By really small, I mean it's 10 to the power minus five. But for our purpose, I will think Reynolds number to be zero, okay? And this is this horribly complicated equation that governs fluid mechanics, this Navier-Stokes equation. But you take the limit of Reynolds numbers changing to zero, and you end up with, I think these are not much nicer PDEs. You end up with a linear differential equation. There is no time. There is just pressure and velocity, okay? And then you, of course, have this incompressibility condition over here. Okay, if you're not seeing the Navier-Stokes equation before, or you've seen this for the first time, it's perfectly fine if you don't follow this part, okay? What, but all I just wanted to remind you is that when do you observe Stokes flow? When do you observe these kind of things? Well, you can see these things when things are very small, okay? If you are bacteria or if you're in microfluidic channels, length and velocities are very small, so Reynolds number can be zero or close to zero. Or if you have a fluid that's very viscous, like silicon oil or glycerin, then the Reynolds number can also be zero or close to zero. Okay. So that's all I want to tell you about maybe Stokes equation. I, I, won't, I won't spend a lot of time, but uh, the thing that I just want to highlight is that we don't live in a world that's low Reynolds number. Everything that's going on inside my room, air flowing, all our things are at high Reynolds number, turbulent kind of stuff. So we don't have a good intuition about things that happens at Stokes law, low Reynolds number. So I'll just play one movie. This is a very classic example to show you that how, how non-intuitive these things can be. So this is, uh, there are two cylinders filled with a dense or viscous fluid. There are dyes, you rotate the inner cylinder, as a result, you shear the fluid and this dye gets mixed, okay? You have this nice mixing, but then you stop. And what you do is that you stir the inner cylinder back in the opposite direction, as you can see over here. And this whole fluid gets unmixed and you end up with what you start with. So this is very counterintuitive, uh, at least when I, the first time I saw it, it it's, it's very confusing because you go in kitchen, uh, you take a cup of water or and add, or you take coffee and add milk to it, and stir with a spoon, it's, you can't reverse it back. If you stir with a spoon and reverse the spoon in the opposite direction, the coffee doesn't stir back and come back to its original position. So this is really something that's happening in Stokes flow where there is no inertia. So the left-hand side of the navel Stokes is inertia. There's no inertia, everything is linear and there is no time. So this is, this is one consequence of having Stokes flow. Okay, so that's, that's my- You track. could use honey though uh, in the kitchen uh, and then you will be able to reproduce yeah, this experiment. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Right. Um, so, I had a question. Uh, yeah. Are those uh, dyes at uh, different radial locations or uh, so, at the same but different uh, angles? So, okay. So, that's a good point. I am not sure actually in, in this experiment whether the dye is at different radial lo locations. Uh, but at least for this flow, the if, if the cylinders are concentric, then the flow has circular streamlines. So, even if they're in different uh, radial locations, Locations, uh, this picture doesn't change. Okay. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room or the bacteria, these tiny particles. So this is the system that I want to model. And let me just remind you one more time that active matter is collection of active particles. So if I want to understand a whole bunch of these active particles, we should start from the microscopic length scale of one active particle. So this is my active particle here. I may use the word particle and bacteria interchangeably from now on. Uh, so that they, are, they mean the same thing for me, okay? So this is how they look. They have a head, okay? Which is uh, five to 10 micrometers of size. And they have this tail, okay? So there's a bunch of uh, elastic filaments, elastic object. This is pretty much like us. You can think of this is our body, this is our legs. And what they do is that they rotate these filaments in order to move around in these fluids like we paddle in swimming pool to go around, okay? So that's, just, that's what they're doing, they're swimming. And of course they're active because they're consuming chemical energy to do this kind of mechanical motion, okay? So this is the active particle. And these are some beautiful experiments uh, done in, in, the, in, in Cambridge actually, in the group of Ray Goldstein, where you, you get these flow fields that, uh, that these particles generate as they move, okay? So this is experiments. And this is theory that compares remarkably well with experiments. And this theory is a solution of these equations that I showed you before, okay? So the theory is coming from the solutions. And this is really at low Reynolds number because they're so small and their velocities are micrometers per second. So Reynolds number zero, they generate these velocity fields and they keep on moving. Let me play a movie and you will see what, how, they, how they look like. Yes, there are these things that is rotating uh, 
their, their flagella, this, this tail, this bunch of filaments at the back is called flagella. So they rotate this flagella in order to move around or swim. And what they do is that they swim for a while and then they suddenly change direction, okay? So this should again remind you of this drunk person who is walking, but he, he's drunk. So he walks, then suddenly changes direction, walks, then suddenly changes direction. So this is again a reminiscent of what I would call Brownian motion. Okay, these are tiny particles, so they're experiencing Brownian motion. Okay, so first I will talk a little bit about kinematics of these swimmers. And I'm just thinking of one swimmer right now, or one particle right now, I'm not thinking of many particles. And the kinematics is a spherical cow model. It's, it's very simple. What I will say is that, that this complicated shape is a point for me. Uh, that's very convenient. And again, just like the Vizcek model, all these points have an arrow. And this arrow is P. So P is the direction uh, which, in which this, these particles move. So P is pointing me to the direction with this particle swimming. And I'm thinking in 2D, so this vector P is uh, is parameterized by this angle theta so this is cosine theta and sine theta so it's a unit vector just telling you the direction in which it is going so my velocity x dot is v naught times p so v naught is a constant velocity or the velocity of swimming plus there is some sort of noise that jiggles this swim around and then the orientation that's how this angle change is also purely because of noise so it's 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 this this vector then this vector is kind of uh, jiggling around. So that's how this angle is changing. So this is the kinematics. And I really want you to understand the kinematics of this. Okay. This is very simple, just particles moving with some constant velocity at a direction given by this vector. P. That's all. Um, and then I need to tell you a little bit about dynamics. And I, I be honest, the dynamics is much more complicated. It, 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 it will require a lot of time. So I will be very brief. Uh, but I assure you, if you don't follow this part, it won't affect what's what's coming next slide. But what you can imagine is that if you're swimming in a pool, what you do essentially by paddling is that you impart momentum to the fluid behind you. And then Newton's third law helps you move forward. So you apply some, you, carry, you give momentum to the fluid back, back and the fluid pushes you forward. So they're doing the same thing. They're applying some forces uh, at, on the fluid backward and then they move forward, okay? And these forces, generate these kind of flows that you see over here. And these are called force dipoles. For reasons, because there are two equal and opposite forces that are acting over here. So if you remember class 11 and 12, if you bring charges plus and minus together, they form charge dipoles. And these are forces plus and minus, and they're forming these force dipoles. And all I just want you to remember this, the direction these forces are acting is in the direction which they're moving. So they are, this, this axis of these forces are aligned with this vector P. Okay, Broto, I have a question. Okay. Or rather, something that I want you to discuss. So, in the previous slide, I think you showed us that uh, Stokes' flow is reversible, right? Through that experiment. Yeah. yeah. Now, go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, uh, especially for the undergraduates who are here, can you explain, based on that that concept, why the, the, the bacterium is uh, shaped like this? Why these this hairs are just on one side? Yes, I can. Uh, can I can I do it at the end of the talk because this will be a digression. So uh, yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is a very good point. Because uh, I wanted uh, to make this point right now because since you showed that experiment, which is really nice, uh, if you want to move forward in this kind of fluid, okay. uh, if the bacterium moves forward and then comes back the same distance, okay, you get a yeah, reversible yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. if it's the okay. symmetric. Okay. So you need, to, you need to have some kind of uh, right. non-simplicity to the structure that is moving through this medium. Okay, okay, okay. Let, let me let me explain this point. Okay, let me let me stop sharing. Actually, uh, can you see me? Yes. Okay. Can you see my hands? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, what <laughs> what Rikata is mentioning is that we are in a very viscous fluid. Okay, uh, and the the thing that I want to drive is that. When we think about swimming pools, we are thinking of Reynolds number that's really large. And the mechanisms that walk in swimming pool to swim, like doing these kind of strokes, they don't walk in this whole world, okay? So a classic example is think about uh, this thing. This is a wedge. This is a shamuk scallop. So it, no, yeah, shamuk is not scallop. I forgot what is scallop, but whatever. So there is this object, uh, it closes suddenly and it ejects some water. So what you expect by closing, you will move in this direction, but you need to come back to its original shape. It opens slowly. 
in if you think about with our intuitions in 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 world of high Reynolds number, we expect that if you do these motions rapidly in one direction and slowly in the other direction, then you should have some motion. But in Stokes law, what happens is that there is no time. There is nothing called fast and slow. So you can't drive motions by doing things fast and slow. So you have to break these kind of reversible loops in certain ways. And one way to do that is to by generally rotating this kind of elastic object. So that's why they're shaped in this, this weird way and the swim this weird way. So I, I, can, I can draw some pictures later on and come back to this point, okay? So what I want to do is that I want to go back to this example of bacteria and I want to derive some equations. So what I want to do for that is I want to share a screen and this will be a test of uh, I guess it's, uh, if this doesn't work out, I will just, okay, I think it works. Can you see my screen? Yes. So uh, a, a warning, okay? So this, this, this uh, I figured out a few, half an hour ago that there is a lag, okay? So there, there will be a lag between my, what I'm writing and what you're seeing, uh, but please bear with me. So uh, first let me, go back to this Brownian motion problem and do a simple problem. So I'm thinking of this particle, this orange particle. Uh, this is a Brownian particle. It's, it's, it's wandering around. It has some velocity, constant velocity, V0. I'm thinking that it's in only one dimension. So my position is dz dt. That's a V0, uh, some velocity plus some sort of noise, eta. Okay. And now if there are many such particles, what I can do is I can define what I call a probability density function that is shy, okay? So this shy tells me what is the probability of finding a particle at some location Z at time T, okay? And what you can do is that you can write an evolution equation for this density function as well. So let me write it down, then I will explain, okay? So this turns out to be this. Okay, so what I did is that this term on the right-hand side is diffusion. That's what we have seen before. So if, if there is just diffusion, then this particle just kind of uniformly spread apart. So this, that, that's this diffusion term that's happening and B is the diffusivity. And I've told you before that whenever there is noise, you should think of an associated diffusion. And this term is called advection, right? So since these particles are also moving, there is, they can carry probability or they can change the probability by their motion that's V naught, and this is an advection term. So that's, that's, I just want to put it out there. And these are called advection diffusion equations. Advection diffusion equation. Okay, so let me let me come back to this point and you will see how this how this is useful, okay? Rotha, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, if you go back to the, yeah, so to this slide. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about the Langevin equation, there is the yeah. noise term. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you have been discussing about the noise term for the last few minutes. So I think it might make sense to think a bit on what this noise entails and how that relates to different systems. So uh, you gave the example of a drunk man. Yeah. Or how the, the a bacteria might change its course. Or the water, water molecules. Uh, Essentially, we are talking about the same thing, right? Right, right. Now, now we know that this kind of mathematical tools are being used in different kinds of systems. Right. A, a crowd of penguins or a, right. a, a bunch of uh, cars or uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. block of bats, right? So essentially, when you are using the same mathematics on different kinds of systems, the only qualitative difference that you can uh, impose on the system is through this uh, noise term. Is that correct? No. So uh, the systems, so that, that's the second part. Uh, so the systems, are inside a medium, right? So for example, the birds are flying in, in air, the bacteria is in a fluid. So the interactions between them must be mediated through the medium. And the mechanics of interaction is very different in air than compared to a bacteria. So that's the second part. So the qualitative and quantitative changes in the system ha happens primarily through interactions. The noise is there. So what I would like to say is that what Shoykata is saying is correct that in noise, in what I've been describing is things like water molecules, bombarding and things getting randomized, but you can have noise or perturbations in general in any problem. So even if the bird, which is flying in sky, of course it's, it's not Brownian, but uh, it may not have exact or precise knowledge of its neighbors. So there is some sort of noise in there. So noise 
the meaning of noise will change in that context. I agree with you. But uh, the primary tuning parameter is not noise. Uh, the tuning parameter is interactions. Okay, yeah. so I have follow up questions. We can come to that at the end. Okay. okay. Bruto, I have a uh, question, a little okay. query about it. So as you told, it's very correct that uh, in the initial slides, you sort of plot, right? If you reduce the noise, the flocking right. phenomena That's appears. Right. That's right. So um, my question is that, yeah, in that x-axis, can we uh, substitute this noise term by a coupling parameter? Absolutely, that absolutely. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a very good point, yeah. Uh, you can absolutely do that. So you remember in that model, I had this radius r, right? So yes. R. So what you can do is that you can keep noise fixed and you can change this radius r, okay? And okay. if the radius r is close to zero, you don't have any flocking or any collective behavior. And as you increase this radius r, you see an emergent flocking behavior. So that's that would be an interaction term. Absolutely correct, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. So uh, let's, let's go back to this problem. This is the bacteria that I'm thinking of. This is inside a fluid. They're generating these velocity fields. This is again one bacteria still now, okay? And uh, this is my vector P. That's direction which is moving. This vector P is cosine theta and sine theta in 2D. I'm thinking in 2D. I should write this clearly. This is 2D. Uh, and then this X is my position vector that has two components, X and Y, okay? So now to do active matter, let me introduce many particles, many active agents. That will be some more arrows over here. I hope these arrows are visible. So there's a bunch of arrows, a bunch of bacteria now in this, in this domain, okay? So let me write down an equation and explain uh, what I mean. So this is what I've written down previously. Okay, so... I wrote down the same equation that I had with one difference that there is a U of X now. So what is this? Let's, let's think about this in, for a moment. And again, I will go back to the swimming pool example. I am in a swimming pool, say, and let's just be imaginative. Suppose there is a big well that swims by me. It generates some sort of disturbance velocity field. And as a result, what happens is that I will move with that velocity. Field. So what's happening is that as these particles are moving in the fluid, each of these particles are generating this kind of flow fields with them, right? Because they are all generating motions of the fluid. And this particle, say, say I'm interested in this particle, say like this particle, then the velocity at this point is not only it's swimming, but also all the other velocities generated by the motions of all other active agents. So this is the interactions that Shoykarda is mentioning, or Chandan mentioned right now, is that this is the interaction that happens through the motion inside a medium, and in this case, it's a fluid, okay? And this U of X is a velocity field that you experience at that point because of collective behavior or collective motion, okay? So that's my evolution equation now. And I can do the same thing for, I'm sorry, let's go back to Y. Uh, I can do the same thing for theta dot. Theta dot is some function of this velocity field, and I won't tell you the function because this function is complicated, but I will explain what it means, plus some noise. So that's my individual, evolution equation for each particles now, because now they're not only swimming, but they're also getting advected or they're also filling each other through these flows that they're generating, okay? So this is my coupling read. And again, I can go to this abstract framework. I want to dwell with it. I will write down the equation. It's perfectly fine if you don't follow it, is that it's, it's, it's you go this abstract setup and say that, okay, I can describe this whole system or this bunch of collection of particles by some function that's shy, that tells me what is the probability of finding a particle at position X, Y with some orientation theta. And you can go, go back to this equation and draw the same analogy and write down the following form. Let me write it down and let me first explain, then I will explain. Del del X of something uh, motion, let's call it motion plus del del Y, uh, motion times chi plus del del theta, theta dot chi is equal to some diffusion. So what I wrote down here is this evolution equation for this chi, right hand side is diffusion. And I always want to think about that whenever there is diffusion, there is noise at the microscopic length scale. That's why there is diffusion. And these are advection. So these are advection, 
in the x direction by the velocity fields. This is a direction in the y direction by the velocity field. That's what I'm calling motion. And this is a direction in the orientation of the angle because of the rotation of these particles of theta dot. Okay. So Brother, let me stop. Uh, one quick question yeah. for the advection term for the x direction, shouldn't it be motion times? Motion times psi, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's right. 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 And right. another uh, quick kind of clarification and question is that um, your, uh, for, for the equations for the position vectors of the particles, yeah. this is kind of a Lagrangian description. That's correct. Absolutely. Actually... That, that's a very good point. Uh, so this is and, a Lagrangian description. And this, and the next equation that you write down, it's kind of like a Eulerian description. So I'm, I'm kind of curious what you do in the next yeah, step. Yeah, yeah. So maybe yeah. Okay. You're right. You're right. So the velocity field U of X is an Eulerian velocity field, but then I wrote down this Lagrangian equation for one particle. You're, you're right. Right. So let me now stop share uh, and let me go back to the slide. Uh, so this, this is the most, uh, I assure you there is, it's not technical here forwards on. Okay. So uh, this is, this is the equation. Now I'm writing everything. So what, uh, what Shrikat said is, is right. So this ux is the velocity field uh, that that I wrote down. Uy is a velocity field in the y direction. This is in the x direction. And then this particle says motion v naught cosine theta and v naught sine theta. So this is showing up in the x. So this is advection of this function psi due to flow and the swimming. And then there is a rotation due to flow and I will explain why it's called rotation. And then there is diffusion. So this is the evolution equation for this, this complicated abstract function psi. Okay, so what is theta dot? Uh, theta is some function of u, and the way I want to think about it is this is very classic Stokes problem at, at showing you the movie. There is an ellip ellipsoidal particle in a flow, shear flow, and it keeps on rotating or tumbling. And if you look at the cell body, this looks like an ellipse. So if you put it in a flow, it will rotate as well, and that's how it will change its direction. Okay, so that is that is what this function u encodes. Okay, so it's a rotation due to the velocity field. But there is only one risk thing that's left to prescribe is that how do you compute these velocity fields ux and uy that these particles are generating? So these velocity fields essentially, how do you compute that? Well, you compute that by solving the Stokes equation, but now you, you, you make use of the fact, well, the Stokes equation is right-hand side zero, but now the right-hand side, there is something. The something is the forces that each of these swimmers are generating. So there, if there are a thousand swimmer, you just add up all the forces together, you plumb them on the right hand side and you start try to solve the Stokes equation. And intuitively, at least, I, I won't write down the what the force is, it's complicated, but intuitively, at least, you can see that if there are many swimmers, if the suspension is very concentrated, okay, if it is like this, this picture B, then this force will be large, right? Many, you think about again like the swimming pool, if there are hundreds of people swimming in swimming pool, then this force will be large, there will be more velocity. And since I told you that these forces are generated along the direction they swim, it should be also some function of this vector p. That's all that I'm going to specify. It's, it's very sketchy, but I think that serves the purpose. I will skip this slide on stress and I will show you a movie. So, okay, we have these equations now, uh, this, this all complicated equations, but they're all coupled, but these are nice because we derive these equations from a physics that microscopic. And this, this equation is, is work of uh, two of my advisors, essentially my PhD and postdoc advisor, uh, David Santia and Mike Shelley. So this is, uh, you can now solve these equations and this is what you see, okay? So in, the, in this picture, you will see concentration. And by concentration, you should always think about a field with crowded people. So when there were, whenever there is a lot of clump, uh, what's the word? When there were a lot of crowding, there it's, the concentration is large. When there are empty spaces, the concentration is low. So yellow colored means large concentration, blue means low concentration. This is the velocities that you generate in the flows. It's a solution from the Stokes equation. And this is the directions where particles are pointing. So initially the particles are pointing in random directions. So this is again, uh, in certain ways, the disordered state of this Vizcek model that I showed you. I'll play the movie, you'll see what happens. Uh, they start moving and the drive and instability essentially and very soon you start seeing these vertical structures appearing, uh, these velocity fields as jets and vortices, and you'll soon see that there is clumping of these particles at some positions. You see these yellow colored bands, it forms large concentration areas. And if you look at this last plot, you, you start seeing these nice bands of where particle gets aligned locally. 
And of course, this velocity field you solve, can solve for. So this looks very much like turbulent flows, but this is not turbulence. This is this is purely at low Reynolds number, okay? Uh, but what, what this flow does is that it is a very good mixer. So this is this is just you're solving some concentration fields for dyes. So this is like a dye, the blue color dye. This motion mixes the dye very well. It stirs it, okay? And this is some more simulations on, on, on discrete particle simulation. You can, you can, so the previous theory is continuum because you're solving PDs. You can also do things discreetly and you also get the same behaviors. Bruto uh, Chandan here. So I was curious, can we somehow relate it to the dynamical concept of basins of attraction? Uh, oh, that's just so, a cu curious question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So can I, can I reflect on this? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Like? So I have just one sure. slide. Just sure. on okay. Okay. So this is last slide. Uh, uh, and depending on whether, uh, whether I have two or three mi more minutes, I can show one more slide, but this is, this is really the last slide. So I wanted to draw close in certain ways that uh, I've told you about active matter, told you about fluids problems in active matters. As engineers, so this field of active matter, there's a lot of physicists working on it. But as engineers, I think there are problems that can be done that we can work on. And most of these problems involves fluid mechanics, which I really like. So I want to talk about two problems uh, that, that just involves fluid mechanics and you will understand how fluids are important. So the first problem is called metachronal waves. So this, this is actually a cell and the cell is covered by tiny hair-like objects, small strings, okay? And these strings uh, are active agents. They kind of beat spontaneously by consuming energy. And again, this is in a low Reynolds number. Together, they form these beautiful waves, as you can see. And my research is kind of centered around these kind of problems. I, I'm really interested in fluid structure interaction problems of these kind of objects. We have thousands of these kind of uh, floppy objects and forming these beautiful waves. This is emergent behavior, collective behavior. And down below, I have uh, an example of high Reynolds number. I spoke a lot about low Reynolds number. So this is a problem of schooling of fish. And this is a re really recent paper. What, what's remarkable is that this paper is very simple. That's, I really like this paper because of that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very simple model of fish. It's in the ocean, it looks like a Vishchek model, but there is fluid mechanics. You think of the fish as potential dipoles in ideal flows, and their interaction can lead to this formation of this be different behavioral swarming, schooling, and this kind of all these emergent behaviors, which look very much like in oceans. I will play a movie from the simulations. And this looks really nice uh, and resembles very well to what you see in oceans. You see this formation of the schools. That's about active matter and active matter and fluid mechanics. And I think I will stop here uh, instead of going more. And I will answer on John's question, uh, but I will end here for the course. So that's that's all for my end. Very nice talk. Really nice. Talk. Thank you. So, uh, so going to Chandan's question first. So uh, there is uh, uh, there is no basins of a. I mean, okay. Uh, there are two answers to this. First is that what you can do is that uh, the equations that I presented, you can put up the equations, and there is you can you can do a linear stability analysis, and the system is actually linearly unstable. So this the state of where everything is randomly oriented is unstable, and the state where everything is aligned is also unstable. So you can show that. Regarding basins of attraction, if, if I understand correctly, uh, the thing probably that you are hinting at is in turbulence, uh, for example, in pipe flows and things like that, you have multiple states that are possible and each of the states have their own basin of attraction. And depending on whether you are in, in, in the right initial conditions of state, you can transition to one of these states. Is that is that right? Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, my point was whatever I wanted to hint is in the absence of noise, okay? So there is no yeah. noise at all. Otherwise, we cannot define basins of attraction. So if there is no noise and we have an interaction coupling parameter, which can be nonlinear in every sense, right? So then if we tune it, we can might, uh, you know, reach to different flocking states, which Absolutely. might be stable in their own uh, perception. So, and then uh, there can be, uh, you know, similar to the sensitivity to initial conditions, maybe some kind of initial trigger would uh, would enable the flocking the active other. matters to jump from one state of the other and they will have their own separate tricks okay. like between okay. the states. So I the work that I am familiar with 
I think what what happens the, the first part that you said is is generally something that happens that you can you can tune interactions and you can get to different states. But the way I would like to think of Bayesian attraction is that you don't tune interactions. You start with the same parameter, mm -hmm. but I would like to believe that there are depending on initial conditions there are states. There's multiple possible states, and depending on initial conditions, you choose a state. Yes. And I don't think that I I've seen that in in most of the literature uh, that I I'm familiar with, but of course, the first part is true. You can tune parameters and reach to different states. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Brother, how about uh, active chaos? So very small changes in initial condition, do they land so, up in different? Okay. okay. So, so we have to be a bit careful while defining this, right? Yeah. So this, this, these are low Reynolds number of flows. Okay. So this, this flows are chaotic in Lagrangian sense only. So if you put a tracer particle, two tracer particles, they separate out exponentially in time, but the flows themselves are not chaotic. They have this complex vertical structure. So if you can define chaos in a Lagrangian sense, there is Lagrangian chaos or chaotic advection, like the classical Hassanar problems, mm -hmm. uh, but this is not chaos in an Eulerian sense that you will define in turbulent flows. But is there some kind of parameter like a topological entropy that one can calculate? I'm sure you can compute entropies uh, for these flows, and I uh, I'm not aware of what has been done with this. For example, I know about a work on uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, let me let me think. There's a work on active pneumatics. I know yeah. that there is yeah. uh, there is this this strings moving around, yeah. and you form these diagrams where you plot the mo motions of the strings as a function of space and time. And you can show that these things braid on each other. So there is a topological entropy there and it goes to a state of maximum braiding. Mm. But again, those are all in Lagrangian sense, right? These are all Lagrangian chaotic problems that we are talking about, not Eulerian chaos in turbulent flows. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let's also ask uh, the uh, audience, the people who are here uh, before uh, I ask my questions or something else. Uh, do, does anyone have any questions? And we want people to be more interactive so that you know, we can know what uh, you feel uh, about, uh, as Abhuta himself said, that he would like to know that how his uh, talk was, if he could have communicated what he wanted. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, yeah, uh -huh. I like this presentation very much because this was a little bit different. Like you show, you ran the code and then you showed some simulations and also explained these things yeah. on, uh, on your iPad. So, yeah, I have one question, maybe, I mean, maybe a trivial one. I'm not from active matter or this pneumatics thing. Yeah, no, no problem. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah I, I see some kind of uh, pneumatic defects originating in these uh, turbulent yeah. structures. Yeah. So, uh, do they have anything to do with this kind of, I mean, how this uh, uh, system evolves or something like that. So what okay. is their role in that? Okay, that's a hard question actually. Okay, so uh, let me answer this. So a lot of the theories that you do for uh, this kind of pneumatic systems, this, uh, let me show you a movie maybe that, that's, that makes it more clear. I, have a, I, have a, I had a movie on this. So this is the, this is the system that I, I think of when I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there uh, are plus- And there is this, this red arrow, blue arrows are, are topological defects. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So the theory of these kind of problems come from theory of liquid crystals. Mm -hmm. uh, liquid crystals are these things where you have these rod-like molecules and things are aligned. Yeah. And you can show that these topological defects can appear when there is a when there is a zero in the pneumatic order tensor. You can define a tensor for the mm -hmm. orientation, and then you can find zeros of the tensor that gives rise to topological defects. There has been an attempt to formulate theories of active matter in terms of topological defects over the last five, six years. Mm -hmm. Major work has been done by Christina Marchetti, who is in Santa Barbara, uh, yeah, yeah. Mark Boyk, a uh, little bit by Sriram Ramaswamy. They have done this problem. I shouldn't pretend that I follow their work very well, but uh, it's, it's absolutely right. You can follow the topological defects to describe this uh, emerging structures. So there is this attempt of understanding these defects uh, generation. And what you can show is that there are two kinds of defects. They're called plus half defect and minus half defects, depending on how they, how they merge. And I think the plus half defect is called a motile defect as it keeps on moving 
while the minus of defect is non-motile, it doesn't move. Or I may say it the opposite way. I'm not sure. So they, they act like uh, charges? Like they they like, act like charges. They act like charges. They can repel each other. They can annihilate. Uh, they can do all these things. Yes, exactly. They act like charges. Absolutely. Okay. And another question would be like, you uh, say that, okay, these active particles, they uh, use their energy in creating these kind of uh, aggregation or collection or show the collective behavior. So, uh, do you uh, or, or can you comment on how much energy different parts of this uh, aggregation they spend like for example if the birds are like the outer periphery of this thing this aggregation I actually don't do they know about that. spend much energy than the in inter inner one or it may yeah. also be in okay. important for this yeah. collective motion of cells like uh, which cells use more atp for example that's a very good question. And I don't have a good answer to that for the birds problem. I don't know. So that's clear. I, I really don't know. Yeah, so I been. can just give a small comment on that only on the macroscopic systems. Okay. Like birds flocking or fish cooling, because I know more about that. So mm -hmm. it's energy is a very important and crucial factor there. And if you just think of a limited finite number of bodies, let's say four or five. So people have worked on showing Permission. that based on the energy efficiency that may be aerodynamic or hydrodynamic, the pattern of their formation changes. So let's mm -hmm. imagine we are in a fish school. So they can form a triangulated fashion of school or a diamond pattern or a grid of patterns with different spacing and offset. It's based on the aerodynamic efficiency so that they can be benefited from the following or the preceding uh, mat elements. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I can tell uh, from so, macroscopy. So, but so basically those systems, they minimize this uh, energy <laughs> for yes. moving, yes. right? Yes. For exactly. example, that minimize the drag of this collective. Uh, exactly. Yes. So, so Chandana, if, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, I know about the formation flights problem, this V-shaped problems. But those are typically done for uh, like, like you mentioned, probably five or six particles. Not yes, as like, I said, yeah, only limited finite number of bodies so, people have studied. Yes. So there is a funny thing that I can tell you, uh, Tomal, at least, uh, is that at least for this microscopic system, uh, bacteria and cilia and things like that, there is no global objective function. There are cases where things uh, beat in or things move in a case of maximum dissipation where they're spending maximum energy. That's the emergent state. Uh, it's not the emergent state is what I'm trying to say. Emergent state is not minimum dissipation because this system have energy continuously injected. So you, you don't evolve to this nice equilibrium kind of properties. But there is no tendency for them to uh, spend as less as possible. No, so there is no tendency. There, there can be different objective functions. For example, one, one thing that I can tell you is that this example that I showed you of metachronal waves of cilia, right? Mm -hmm. What happens is that as they as they generate these waves they pump a lot of fluid so the thing that's kind of optimized is the efficiency of pumping but yeah. that doesn't lead to a state of minimum dissipation it's the ratio of how much you pump and how much you dissipate that that probably matters and there there are there are cases of synchrony and there can be emergent states where the state is actually a state of maximum dissipation mm -hmm. so for the bacteria problem at least the, the this theory i was describing you can compute the energy dissipation completely in the domain and then plot how things look like in this domain but i don't have uh, an idea of how it how it should look like on top of my head mm -hmm. yeah i think yeah, yeah i i recently watched one uh, online uh, online presentation from the professor you just mentioned in santa barbara official marketing yeah, 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 and yeah, that was really fascinating. Like, yeah, yeah, pretty, yeah. I mean, she she does exceptionally nice work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, thanks, thanks for this very nice presentation. Yeah, that's really, really. I nice. mean, far, far, I mean, at the beginning of my talk is borrowed from Christina's talk. This, uh, this some examples I've borrowed from Christina's talk. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone you else have a, have a question? You can stop recording first. Uh, and then... yeah, I, I was going to the. Uh, add to that is uh, so I, I would say that I would have presumed as you defined active matter in the very beginning that these are uh, systems which are driven so uh, I would presume that it has no such prerequisite of uh, following a minimal uh, dissipation or anything like that 
and right. uh, so, uh, so uh, in that follows. Fifty four, G. I. Taylor did this walk uh, where he showed that if there are two sperm cells that are swimming side by side, if they are flagella, the tail is in phase or in synchrony, then they reach a state of minimum dissipation. And I think for a long time people believed that things would uh, things would go to this minimum dissipation states, but there are a lot of recent papers that have showed that flagella synchronized to a state which is state of maximum dissipation, not the minimum dissipation actually. And that's exactly what you said right now, because they are driven by energy. Okay, if you could go to the uh, slide before the last slide, uh, uh, where um, you were showing uh, okay. uh, schooling and many of the things, examples, essentially. Yeah, this one. This so one? yes, so uh, this is uh, the slide before that where you uh, showed uh, your simulations uh, and how they were not your uh, uh, the work of Saint Ian and uh, Shelley, yeah. and after that uh, the one that you showed. I think it's this. Uh, yeah, probably this. Yeah. So so before I come to this, my question would be that in general, when you are doing these uh, simulations and or, or even explaining schooling and other things, uh, when you so when you talk about diffusivity, what's the value of diffusivity that you take? Because I can think of diffusivity in the values for systems where I can measure them for a fluid and other things. Uh, but uh, for schooling or something else, or even when you're using it for... So for uh, okay, go ahead. I mean, it, it, very, very different systems. Okay. Let me stop sharing and answer this. Okay. So, so that's a good point. So when you're doing numerical simulations of uh, the equations that I showed, the simulation that uh, David and Mike did. Uh, you take the diffusivity that makes your numerical simulation stable. <laughs> so that's that's uh, that's one way to choose diffusivity. You, you don't want things to blow up uh, numerically, and diffusion helps things to not blow up. So that that that's numerically you can of course do that. Uh, in discrete models, you can of course add noise to just see. How, I mean, if you add a lot of noise, things will be destroyed because of noise. I mean, it's random. But there is ways to measure diffusivity. What people have done, actually, Ray Goldstein have done this. So what he does is he takes a big beaker or tube, and he takes a bunch of cells, chlamydomonas, the swimming cells, puts it, he centrifuges it, and all the cells settle down to the bottom. Okay, And then he just lets it go. So the cells crawl back. And what he does is that he tracks the center of mass of this whole thing that's spreading out. And he plots the mean square displacement of that. And that mean square displacement goes as linearly as time. So you can measure what's the effective diffusivity of this whole cluster from that kind of experiments, if you want to measure it from experiments. And once you know the diffusivity from experiments, you know how to tune the parameters in your model to get the right diffusivity. So you're saying that in each of these system, I need to find out the diffusivity based on uh, the mean square displacement. And so I have to right, do an experiment right. that can mimic that and I can get the diffusivity out of it right. in that sense. Right. If, but if what you, about the cases really where you be, are studying ciliary motion? If you really want to be quantitative about this experiment. Yeah, go ahead, no. Yeah. So the, what about the cases where you, you were showing a motion of flagella and all of that? And uh, yeah, that's a, so that's, that's in that So flagella is actually not, uh, okay. There, 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 there are many, many, many things here. So the noise can come from two sources in those problem is that if the filament that you're thinking of itself can be Brownian, it can itself be floppy, fluctuating. Flagella is not a filament like that. It's, it's quite stiff. The noise in that problem comes from the fact that there are molecular machines that drives the oscillation of these filaments. And these uh, molecular machines are noisy oscillators. That's where it comes from. Of course, it's very hard to measure the noise. But there is an experiment uh, that's done from Frank Hulish's group, where what they have done is that they have tracked a flagella of a bull sperm for many periods, and they have constructed a reduced order model of that flagella by doing PCA, principal component analysis. So they just get a limit cycle. And what happens, they find, what they find is that if it's a nice oscillator, then it's a circular limit cycle or some, some closed orbit essentially, but their experimental points are scattered on the limit cycle. But from the scatter of the points on this limit cycle, they could measure what's the effective diffusivity that should be on the on that cycle to give this rise of scatter. So they quantitatively measure uh, effective diffusivity at the microscopic length scale of these oscillators on motors that gives rise to oscillations. 
So it's a, it's it's a hard task. So if you if you really want to be quantitative about what is the amount of fluctuation that you have in the system, you have to do very difficult and precise experiments for that. Huh. Uh, the experiments can differ depending on which organism you're studying. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a uh, very complex, at least uh, to find the match. It's a complex stuff. Uh, at least for theory, you, you just think of diffusion as something that smooths, smooths out. That's how we think of diffusion is. I, I mean, when, when we do simulations, at least, yeah. I mean, if something blows up, you can just <laughs> add a bit of diffusion to it and see what happens. So there are there are several other people in the in this call who, do you guys have any questions? And I think I think I see Deepten shared as well. Deepten sir. Are you in the call if you have any questions? Probably. Hello, sir. Okay. Okay. Brother, I have two Anyhow. questions. Okay. So uh, uh, the first question relates to what John Don said a few minutes back. So can we think of it in a more dynamical systems perspective where we have some local attractors and maybe figure out the bifurcations? And he also pointed out quite correctly that when you have noise, we cannot really do that. We cannot have that, that uh, accurate phase best idea about a system. So let me ask you this question and this relates back to RF's work as well. So, uh, Let's think about looking at two vortices. They move around. So uh, about about themselves. So going by your definition of what is an active particle, those vortices are active particles, right? You add more vortices into the system. You can think about a wake structure. Uh, as we add more vortices, am I right that that is an active matter system, although there is no noise? So what is the definition of active matter as such? So the vortices are of not them where the vorticity is concentrated within a dynamical point. That means that it has a source of energy to move around based on what the surrounding media is like. Can that a source be of energy, but it is always losing that energy because of viscous dissipation. It's not continuously getting injected by energy. So whenever you think of active uh, matter, there can be other effects which would help in its motion, right? Let's not think about the yes. uh, viscosity. Let's think about an implicit medium. What happens then? Maybe what uh, Soikanta is pointing out, let's think about 2D turbulence. Okay. So, so if you think of such a system and just imaginary, so where there are spontaneous formation of vortex couples and, you know, movement. The turbulence decays, right? 2D turbulence is weird. It's, 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 it's one of these so, But weird if we things. have a source of energy to sustain that. Well, yes. If you have a source of energy, then you can, of course, definitely think of this system as active system. So let me, uh, we're going to show this. So, so there are, there are two questions. Okay. I, I will. So John's question, I, I will answer. Uh, let me let me first address the first, first part. So I won't think of vortices as active particles because whenever I think of active particles, I will always think of them, they have their own fuel. So it's like a car, which is carrying their own stuff and they're consuming energy continuously from that. Vortices do not have their own fuel, which are always in, getting injected in them. So vortices are not active particles. They are not self-propelled. They are propelled because of the motion of the fluid. If there is no fluid motion, if there was no medium, they won't get propelled. Bacteria is propelling itself. And when you have just many bacteria, they exhibit something collective. That's active matter, an active particle. Let me, let, me, let me defer here, Boto. Even if there is no ambient flow, if you think about a three vortex structure, think about uh, the world that RF did or Strenda did yeah. when you were a student. They do move around. So why can't we call them uh, active matter? Well, because you're not driving them by injection of continuous energy. So if you, okay, let's, let's put it this way. If you want to do thermodynamics of these kind of systems, the thermodynamics is governed by equilibrium laws in the three vortex problem. If you want to do a thermodynamic calculation, if you want to do thermodynamics of active matter, you can't use any equilibrium principles. It's a system that's driven by definition. It's a system that is in a state of non-equilibrium thermodynamics problems. There is no equilibrium energy that you can minimize and find structures of system. So even in work of uh, RF and Stremler, where they have work on vortex crystals, where these nice uh, structures emerge because of interactions. I mean, they're beautiful work. I just don't want to call it active matter. I would rather call it passive matter with some emergent behavior. Remember that things like granular material also exhibit jamming, gaseous state, uh, emergent behavior and clustering. 
and by granular material, you inject energy, you shake them, you do that. But even in those cases, those are not active system in certain ways because you're injecting energy, but then you stop it. Not each and every particle at the microscopic length scale are active. Yeah, I tend to agree. So in a very specific way, what activity does is when you are solving Hamilton in, now it's very technical, but let me, let me say this clearly. So if you are solving a vortex, vortex problem, you're solving essentially some, some Hamiltonian, right? Hamiltonians in those problems are, have an intrinsic uh, time reversal symmetry at the microscopic length. So if you reverse time, things just go back in the opposite direction. What you do in active matter system is that you break this time reversal symmetry at the microscopic length scale by injecting continuous energy. So these systems, the equations of motion do not obey time reversal symmetry. They continuously generate entropy. And more fancy way, they carry some arrow of time. So the equations of motion are not, does not obey time reversal symmetry at the microscopic length scale. And it's different from a fluid that's driven by some external field that, that where you collectively break the symmetry. Here you're breaking the symmetry at the microscopic length scale. So they are not active system, I would say. So, so, if, yeah, so that, my talk, uh, if that is your- The next uh, day. Shikha, just a moment. So if that is your answer to the question and then let's bring it back to what Chandan said yeah. before. So that means that we cannot have this kind of phase structure analysis in active matter is that right well we which which phase structure because 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 when you are talking about bifurcations when you're talking about this kind of trajectories there is there's always a tendency to 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 uh go to a lower energy state which no. is not necessarily true in active matter no, absolutely, absolutely. i completely agree with that i completely agree with that yes okay absolutely. so we cannot define it to be a self-excited system can we Okay, so these are these are all related terms, you know, uh, self-excited system, uh, excitable media, if you want to call it. Uh, the way I would define excitable media are systems that are uh, stable to linear perturbations. I mean, it's stable to linear order, orders. System which typically show uh, subcritical transitions where you apply a perturbation that's beyond a threshold and it transitions. Those are excitable media. Classic example is this Fitsu Nagumo model that you have for neurons. You need a perturbation that that's beyond some threshold exhibit. In fluid mechanics, an excitable media is pipe flow. So pipe flow is a problem where we do in undergrad, we do experiments. We know this Reynolds number is 2,300. Then someone does a careful experiment, the Reynolds number becomes 75,000. Some, someone does a more careful experiment, the Reynolds number becomes 10 lakhs something. So it's, it's, it's crazy because that system is exactly like you're saying, it's an excitable problem because you need a finite perturbation to trigger instabilities. System that I'm still describing, that are still linearly unstable. The equations I described that are not uh, are not subcritical. Funny, funny part. At least in theory, the problem of cilia is is subcritical. It's 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 linearly stable, and you need a finite perturbation. But it's not a generically that case. A lot of active matter theories that's developed by David and Mike Shelley here and Christina Marchetti. Those, those are Sridham Ramaswamy who literally started the field. Those are all linearly unstable systems. So I won't call it excitable in that sense. Regarding Shoikata's point, you can still have multiple states. I don't think of multiple states prevented from... Uh, so, I mean, you can think of whole turbulence of these PDEs, not as active matter, but just PDEs. Let's just think about this, some mathematical structure PDEs. If these are nonlinear PDEs, they, 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 they can support multiple solutions and there can be states from a dynamical system perspective, there can be multiple states. I don't think Physics prevents that from happening, but it's then you have to solve the equation and see whether that exists. Yeah, but Both I think yes. Non-technical non question, uh, in terms of uh, the mathematics as well. So when you think about using these tools, so let's think about uh, three different systems. Let's think about the the school of fish. Let's think about uh, the a group of cards. And let's think about uh, uh, the ciliary hairs, maybe on the mucus that you had on the last slide. Yeah. So we know that ciliary hairs, they don't have any kind of consciousness, right? So you can purely uh, dictate their behavior through mathematics and physics of the medium. Yeah. And, and that way, the, the entire uh, uh, theory of the so-called active matter can be entirely applied in those kind of systems. We can also assume that uh, the, the bacteria, they don't have any consciousness, and you can apply that there as well. Now let's come to the. Uh, I know. I, of, yeah, this is this is a very good question. This uh, is, this is a generally very good question. Yeah. A shoal of fish. I know that with fish, uh, people have done experiments where they have 
basically used a dead fish or a plastic fish that the the the, the fin is flapping and 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 there is good experimental validation as well so i don't have much dispute with the fish because uh, let's just assume that fish is not very intelligent now uh, i see uh, uh, people uh, using the same tools on uh, 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 a traffic of cars and i know that the car is still being driven by a human subject right and uh, to the best of my knowledge human beings are the most intelligent creatures that have been developed yet okay, so how okay. can you do that okay, to okay. matter okay. okay. kind of okay. 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 <laughs> i mean i think this is this is a good point this is a philosophical question but this is a genuine good point so uh, let me answer the question in the following way suppose you are in a big room okay and the room has closed walls so this is a art gallery there is a lot of pictures on the wall and maybe there are five of us okay and our there is a global objective the objective is that we want to see all the pictures that's the objective so we can now move in a random and disordered way we can go from one wall to the other we can move without talking to each other we can move consciously like you mentioned we can decide where we want to go but now suppose you pack this room with 200 people okay now of course you are you are following your conscious you want to go to a picture and you want to go there it's not like that you want to go somewhere else you're still following your conscious but you have a constraint now this constraint is that you don't want to hit people you don't want to collide with people right you don't want to step on someone's feet so this conscious you of course your objective is still to see all the pictures but you're not constrained by the medium now you're constrained by this medium to behave or interact in certain ways and as a result now if you put a drone or camera and see these pictures you will find uh, at least this kind of system is crowding problem there are some what's called edge currents you will find some people moving along the border or on the on the in front of the walls there is a some sort of current people going this way so this is in certain ways an emergent behavior of course you're doing your thing that's conscious but you're forced by the medium to obey certain rules as long as there are rules to obey you can have some emergent behaviors and i completely agree with you in the spirit is that if if it's uh, if it's human beings it's very it's it's, it's a bit far fetched to apply these tools uh, who can make their own decisions but if you are in a regime where things are extremely constrained and then if, then turns out what what i what is nice about this check models and things like that is that it tells you that you can start with something very complicated but you are kind of bound by very simple rules that you have to be aligned with your neighbors you don't want to hit someone and things like that so there are systems actually i didn't talk about it at all it's a there's a called dry active matter where there is no fluid particles purely interacting to steric interaction so only thing you don't want to occupy the same space and in those problems there are things called phase separations of motility new space separation mips so you, you get this clusters formation and everything in those problems as well I, I agree with you in the spirit completely, but uh, the tools or the mechanisms are in certain ways the rules are pretty general, which can be applied in certain contexts if you are very careful. But okay, so maybe I can add a concluding line to this. So when you are talking about uh, looking at the physics of any system, so for example, in a fluid mechanics system, you can use Navier-Stokes equation, but when you are looking at uh, tracking crowd behavior of of human beings. Uh, the equations or 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 the medium that you are using is entirely different so suppose you are in a museum and you Absolutely. want to go see Absolutely. that picture x painting x that is the that is the 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 attractor that is driving the crowd behavior i agree so yeah i hope my question was not too mocking but uh, the thing is these things need to be clear to the people who are starting out as well uh that no, uh, i mean i mean i mean it's not it's, it's not at all mock it's, it's it's of course you develop a theory for a certain systems and right right and uh, i think i think these uh, identifying these attractors are also a part of this re this research like yeah absolutely, like absolutely. which gradient uh, i mean for example chemotaxis in cells or right, chemotaxis right, in right, cells right, right. i mean you have to identify what actually drives them right absolutely so that is the part of this research itself I right mean, right i mean i mean uh, tomonda and broto uh, even in medical science or even in if you are talking about social science uh, for example crowd behavior in the traffic of cars i think it is very important to figure out what the objectives are yeah and exactly i completely agree the objective them for penguins and for human beings right so it's important that we understand that and i, I think that yeah. huge prospect of applying these tools over the next 10 years to solve some of the other open questions that we have in the related fields no i i agree with that i completely agree with that Yeah, I can agree with that. That philosophy and that principle. Yeah, it's not mocking. It's 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 just genuine commentary. Yeah, uh, 
I, I, I just want to reflect on Chandan's comment once, uh, study turbulence comment. So there is a class of PDs uh, that's been developed for studying bacteria, which is which looks like neighbor stocks. But then what you do is a 2D neighbor stocks, so 2D turbulence, 2D turbulence is decaying. But what you do is that you add a negative diffusion to the problem. So by negative diffusion, you're injecting energy. And if there was just negative diffusion, it will blow up, right? It's, it goes to infinity. But what you do is that you add a negative diffusion, then you add a positive hyperdiffusion. So there's a fourth derivative term. And then there's- the, kind of. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. It's, it's like a swift Hoenberg term in, in that equation. And what happens is that you, you, you destabilize a certain wave numbers and you stabilize other wave numbers. And the destabilizing wave numbers is wave numbers where you inject energy, essentially. You continuously inject energy in those wave numbers and extract out energy from the other wave numbers. Let me let me show you a funny movie uh, that I have. This is, this is going to be very... Can, can we actually stop recording now? So this will look very, very weird. Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. So I said that it's fine even if it's recording. I can uh, trim cut the it. video. Okay. And... okay, please yeah. then do, do cut it because... Uh, this 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 will look look so weird. <laughs> Let me stop sharing first because I, I don't want to look weird. Uh, but let me show you a movie. I don't have I wanted to show this movie from their paper, but I didn't have one. I couldn't find one. So this is a movie, as you can see over here. Can you see this picture? Yeah. So this is an example of uh, turbulence that's driven by driven by stuff. Okay, driven by these wave numbers. And this doesn't decay. There is this small vortices that keeps on forming uh, and they keep on rotating. And this is exactly what Shoikot mentioned. There is terms that uh, look like swift Hohenberg and flocking. These are entirely, entirely what I would say, phenomenological PDEs, but it's, it's in the same spirit that you said that it's 2D turbulence, but with energy injection in these problems. And there is a length scale at which you inject energy and that length scale kind of determines the size of these vortices. So yeah. That's so I think it. overall, yeah, yeah. an overarching comment may be that even though nonlinear uh, or non-equilibrium dissipative systems, such as let's say thermal convection uh, driven by uh, really number or temperature difference, or maybe yeah. fluid flow driven by uh, a Reynolds yeah. number, right? So these systems, although they also exhibit, I mean, active matters, uh, act active systems can exhibit certain uh, transitions like these systems, they but overall active active systems are different because of the in the micro scale they are. Yeah, exactly. That, that that's a very that, good point. So if you have a set of charge and you're applying electric field, all the charges move, right? So it, in certain ways you can thinking that yeah. well, I'm driving them. But this is a symmetry breaking at the global scale. You apply a field to break the symmetry mm. at a global scale. On active matter, you are breaking symmetry at the microscopic length scale, all the particle has a broken symmetry in the problem. There is no time reversal symmetry for each and individual part. So they are different in this sense. You're absolutely right. I mean, so you're saying that every particle has a forcing term. It's not like yeah, the every global- particle uh, energy. Yeah. Every particle yes. is energy. And they, yes. they, they move by themselves. They don't depend on external forces. Yes. For the so, yes, uh, for the mucosillian yes, uh, of course we have the envelope approach. But uh, could you apply this kind of tools but you actually think about the self-activation of a single hair? Yeah, and then I, think, I think if you can stop the recording, then I can talk about it. Uh, it's, it's in a, Okay, I'll, I'll it's stop the recording. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's, let's stop the recording. Let's stop the recording.